The Mystery of the Cupboard by Lynn Reed Banks, Chapter 12, Jenny. Once started, the old man couldn't stop. It poured out, and Omri sat there in the garden and listened, one part of him worrying about his family at the pub. But that was only a small part. The rest of him was concentrating on Tom and his Jenny. Jenny had been a maid in a large Victorian household sometime in the 1870s. Around when Boone was a boy, Omri thought. It was hard to compare them. Their lives had been so different. She had been put into service when she was only 12 and had been a servant for eight years when an awful snobbish family in Dorchester with lots of children and a house she had been put into service when she was only twelve when she was only twelve, and had been a servant for eight years with an awful snobbish family in Dorchester with lots of children and a household of servants. They made her sleep in a tiny attic without any heating, gave her half a day off a month, allowed her no followers, boyfriends, Tom explained, and worked her like a slave from morning till night, doing the hardest, lowest household chores for practically no money. Her own large family lived in poverty in the country, quite near where they were now, as it happened, so there was no way they could help her. In fact, most of the little she earned went straight to them. She couldn't save anything. There was no escape. This was to be her whole life. Then one night, when she was asleep, curled up against the bitter cold in her little room, under the roof, she was transported into a different world, a different time. She found herself in a country farmhouse, much like the one she'd been born in only that it wasn't so poor, and she was tiny, or at least she thought everything around her was huge. Terrified at first, she soon, she, soon, she soon found that this was not as she'd thought a nightmare. On the contrary, she seemed to be living a dream of happiness in the home of this giantess whom she learned to call Miss Jessie, and who, instead of expecting Jenny to work for her, did everything in her power to please her and make her happy. She gave her delicious things to eat as much as she wanted, the first time in her life she had had enough and spoiled and cosseted her. She even taught her to read using tiny cut-out pages printed clearly in big brown ink letters. But the best thing she did was talk to her and treat her as an equal, as a person with rights and dignity, as a friend. In the beginning, Jenny was shuttled between her two worlds, and it was like shuttling between hell and heaven. But hell all day, but hell by day wasn't so bad when you knew that heaven was waiting. She began to spirit away things that she needed in that heavenly other place, such as sewing things so that she could make her own clothes, not out of the coarse cloth, not out of coarse cloth, but from the but from the silks and muslins Miss Jessie supplied. She brought her own eating utensils hidden in her pockets, and then she grew bolder. With her pitiful wages, she bought some cook pots, shoes, books, and other carryables. At night, she would bundle these necessities up in a pillow slip and cuddle it in her bed so that when Miss Jessie summoned her, as she called it, as when the hated real-life mistress peeled one of the household bills, the things that she needed would go with her. In Dorchester, in the Dorchester household, they began to complain about her. She was constantly tired. There were times when she couldn't be wakened. A doctor was called, but could find nothing wrong with her. Eventually, after a prolonged visit, the after beseeching lasted several blissful days, she had awakened in the poor ward of the big hospital. The nurses were bewildered. As she lay there, apparently unconscious, eating nothing.